Good evening. As we continue to look at the book of John, we're going to look at John chapter 14 tonight. And Jesus is, as we talked about, he's, he's, this is the farewell discourse, so he's wanting to encourage and comfort his disciples after he, for when he leaves. And so in this one, we're really going to see uh, that, that Jesus is going to comfort them. And he wants to, he wants to encourage them in knowing that there will be some sadness, that there will be some discouragement, potential discouragement as he dies, because they're still trying to grasp everything that's, that's going on. So a couple things we're going to see in this section tonight. First, we're going to see um, that Jesus is going to give them comfort in knowing they will be with him in the future. He's already said, well, I'm going to a place you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And so he's going to give them comfort by giving them hope. And isn't that the same thing that gives us comfort in discouraging times is the hope that we have in Christ. We see this in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let's read this together. It says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my, fa in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus encourages the disciples to not let their hearts be troubled because he knows that's going to happen. He knows that there's going to be this potential that when Jesus is gone, when he dies, they will be sad, their, their hearts will be troubled. Uh, in our language, this would by, be like saying, don't let, and I don't think he just doesn't want them to be sad. It's like saying, don't let your determination be wavering. He, he doesn't want them to lose focus. He doesn't want them to lose sight of what they will be, they will be doing and be needing to be doing because, uh, even after he's gone. Uh, he follows that up with how it is possible, how it's possible for them not to lose heart, how it's possible for them not to lose their determination. Again, uh, what is it, what's another way of saying something that, that allows us to not lose determination or be troubled in heart. That's hope, right? Uh, with, with anything, when we, have, when we have potentially bad news, what keeps us moving forward? What keeps us motivated? Say you get a, a diagnosis that, 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 that's a bad diagnosis. What keeps you motivated to keep fighting? It's, it's hope that, uh, it's hope of recovery. It's hope of a cure. It's hope that, that can motivate us to keep moving. And that's what he's saying to his disciples. He's saying, do not be troubled. Do not lose heart. And I think there's a lot of application for us today because as we look around, there's a lot of things that can trouble us and cause us to lose determination. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff going on around us right now. And I think Jesus' message to us would be the same. Don't lose heart. There's hope. There's something to look forward to. There's something to continue to fight for. There's something to live for each day. Um, he says it, it, it's possible the way to keep a proper determination when he is gone is to trust in God. And, and he's, he's going to share a promise that's been given to them. He says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. He says, where I'm going, you can't follow, but I'm going to prepare a place for you that you will come to later. It gives hope. Jesus begins to paint the big picture of God's grand plan for the redemption of those who believe in him. Uh, as, as we have often seen in John, uh, Thomas and some of the disciples, they don't fully understand. Look at verse 3. It says, if I go to a, go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. And you know the way where I'm going. But Thomas, look at verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And so we, we get Thomas is kind of like Peter, but Thomas, he, he's... He has a little bit of doubt at times, as we'll see in the next uh, next several weeks. We're going to see a very common uh, passage that we, we know of where Thomas doubted and Jesus showed him, uh, showed him the holes and showed him the proof of his resurrection. Well, Thomas questions here. He says, how, how do we know where you are going? 
And Jesus replies to him. He gives an answer. And in this answer is another one of the great I am statements. And we've had several of these throughout John so far. The I am statements. But he's going to give three I am's here. Three that we know very well. He says, first, he says in verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the way. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, in saying this, the word for way is hodos, and it was a traveler's term, meaning a footpath, a road, or a highway. It has a metaphorical sense, such as Jesus' earlier statement of being the door or the gate. Remember when we said that? And he, he's going to say here, I am the, the footpath. I am the roadway. I am the way to get to the Father. And there's only one way to the Father. Jesus says this in other places. He says there's only one way to the Father. And it's through the Son. So Jesus provides the way or the gate, the single road to the Father. And it's only through Jesus. The next thing that he says, he says, I am the way and the truth. Uh, the truth. He says, I am the truth. The truth. Uh, there is truth and uh, there is falsehood. There is one truth or right way of living, and Jesus is the persona of that truth. And we understand this. He says, I am the way and the truth. The truth is only found in Jesus. See, the world tells us that uh, in relativism today says there's many truths, and you just pick the one that's best for you. You pick the one that fits and don't force yours on me. Well, that, that can't be so because Jesus here says there's only one truth. So if, if, uh, if that's not true, if there are many truths, Jesus is a liar and the things, it invalidates everything he says and he does. But we know because of historical evidence and the reliability of the text that Jesus is the truth. And he provides for us this, this template or this example of what truth is. And then he says, and this is something he's referred to before as well, he says, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he says, I am the life, and Jesus has already touched on life and resurrection. This is spiritual and eternal life that is only brought through through Jesus. And this is similar to John chapter 4, the woman at the well, the discussion on, on spiritual water. This, this, uh, this eternal water, this life source. And that's what Jesus is. He is the only way to the Father. He is um, the, the truth and the example of truth. And He is, He is the life. And He is the source of eternal life. So he leaves this as, as a comforting fact to the disciples. He says here, I'm going to leave, um, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And here's how you will know. Here's how you will know the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Second thing that we see in, in verses 7 through 14 is another comfort. It's comfort in knowing the Father through Christ. It's, it's the comfort in, in knowing the Father because we know of the importance of, of knowing the Father in order to have eternal life. Look at verses 7 through 14. He says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father. Also from now on you know him and have seen him. And, and look at what Philip says. Um, so Jesus is going to follow up his I am statements, reminding them of the knowledge of the Father that comes through the Son. But Philip, uh, kind of, as we see, we see kind of a lack of understanding in the disciples. And Philip, it's Philip's turn here. He said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. See, we, we kind of see this lack of understanding. He, he's still thinking in, in these physical terms. Okay, well, just allow us a glimpse to the Father. Just let us see Him, and then we'll, we'll believe everything that you're saying. But look at what Jesus says. Jesus shows uh, some great patience because Jesus is saying, I've been saying this all along. Look at verse, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, we'll get into that in a minute. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But we see here that, that Jesus is, is, is going to, to tell them as Philip kind of struggles with this. He says, I've, we've been over this before. I and the Father are one, a statement he's made several times throughout the book of John. He says, if, you've, if you want to see the Father, you see him through me because we are one. I am in the Father, he is in me. This is something, a, a very important theological principle that we need to come to grips with. And this is, this is part of God's plan, is that, that Jesus is the representation of the Father. He is, uh, he came to make visible the invisible God. Because of our weaknesses, because of our need for, for proof and, and to be able to see things in our own uh, ways and terms, God became man in Jesus Christ. And the Son came to earth and, 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 and lived just like us. And that's what he's saying is, is that's, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm doing is showing you the Father. And if you believe in me, you can see the Father. If you see me, you can see the Father. And that's important for us to remember as well as we talk about apologetics and that if we, if we can see the historical Jesus, really a man that really did these things and really did the works and, and proved the resurrection, what do we have? We have God who has come to earth to show us the way to the Father. Uh, the final comfort that he gives them is in verses 15 and then also 21 through 24. Uh, and in verse 15, we just, we just kind of pick this up. Uh, in, in verse 15, we see uh, that comfort will come through their love and obedience. All right, verses, verse 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. A verse we use often. Do you, and I ask you every time we bring up this verse, do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Then Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's a response, see, see and we, we see so, so many claiming to love Jesus, but doing everything opposite of what he says. You can't separate the two. If you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. If you do not love Jesus, you, no matter how much you say it, uh, you won't keep his commandments. Further in verses 21 through 24, Jesus qualifies this statement by, by saying, if you love him and keep his commandments, which he says is the same thing, then my father will love you and I will disclose myself to you. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Now look at what Judas says here. Judas Iscariot, uh, Judas not Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot, as we know, is already gone, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. And so Jesus, uh, Judas brings up this question, why won't you disclose yourself to the world? There's another qualifying statement that comes in verse 27. Um, you cannot think of this in the usual terms of the world. Look at verse 27. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, troubled nor let it be 
fearful. In verse 21 through 24, show the way in which Jesus means this. God discloses to the world on his terms. And here's his terms. Love and obedience. All right. Uh, we also see comfort in these verses, comfort in, uh, in the future with the helper given to them. And Jesus is going to talk about uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit in verse 16. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Uh, and, and so Jesus assures them that he will not abandon them as orphans, but God will send a helper, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus does not give them the full understanding of the Holy Spirit here. That will come later. And we see that on Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Um, Jesus will uh, later, we see this fulfillment of this, this uh, promise. And we later understand that the helper was given to them for teaching and for inspiration. But we also see that, that the, the apostles had some specific things that the helper was to do. But also we see that all Christians receive the Holy Spirit with, with some benefits that we read throughout Scripture that we have as well. And so as we look at this tonight, we see that as Jesus is preparing to leave, he's, he, he's leaving his disciples and he wants to comfort them in his departure. And he comforts them uh, in, in knowing that they will be with Jesus. Now, here's the thing, is the comfort, I know it was very specific to them in the few days that they would be before they would see Jesus raised from the dead and all of that, but we still need comfort in, in knowing that we have hope as well. Because we see some very discouraging things. We see things in the world all around us. And so it's important for us to be reminded, I think especially at times such as this, to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, that knowing Jesus, we can know the Father. And that through Jesus, we have a way to the Father to eternal life. He says, I am the way. And, and through Jesus, if you obey, uh, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're obedient to the gospel, that's the way to the Father. And he says, I am the truth, and there is truth, and there is falsehood. And Jesus is truth. His word is truth. And he says, I am life, that through me you can have that eternal life. And then he, he gives, gives us comfort in, in that even though we can't see God, even though God is invisible to us in, in physical terms, we can see him through Jesus, through the historical Jesus who walked this earth, who lived and was tempted in the very same ways that we are. And he lived so that he could give us, so that he would die and give us that hope of everlasting life. Um, and then we see... Comfort, and I think this is important, comfort will come through our love and our obedience. That as we look at the world around us, that we know we can have hope. And that hope, uh, that hope can be seen through our love of Jesus and our obedience to Him. And I ask it again, do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Are you keeping His Word? And my question for us tonight, as always, is are you his child? Have you kept the word of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and given your life to him? If not, please reach out to us. Let's pray together as we close out this evening. Dear God, we thank you so much for these important words that Jesus gave to his disciples and also to us, knowing that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we do have access to you. And it's through him. And we're so thankful for the life that he lived, the death that he died, so that we can have that, gain that access to eternal life. And we're so thankful for that. We pray, we pray that we know that obedience, love and obedience is so important to you. And we know that we fail at times. And we pray for your forgiveness. And we're thankful for your grace in those areas. But we pray, most importantly, that we get up and we continue to strive to live according to your word. We do love you and we thank you so much for Jesus and it's through his name we pray. Amen.